began a few weeks ago, really, we began a study of looking at biblical terms used in unbiblical ways. And many times when you're discussing religious material or matters with other people, and even though you may think that you're talking about the same thing, you're going to find out that in, in your discussion that you differ because one person's meaning and the other meaning are not the same. Why is that? Well, that's because Thumb tried to define words and biblical words with theology and with understanding of their particular religion instead of sticking to the text in what the Bible says. Therefore, you get two differing conclusions. And so we examined that last week, and we began to look at this making application of that by looking at the church. We began looking at the church and showed that the word church means a called out assembly. And we looked at it in the two biblical ways that is talked about in the, in the scriptures. In the Bible, it's talked about in a local sense, like a local church, like the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, and then we looked at the universal sense, as the Lord added daily to the church of those who are being saved, Acts 2.47. And so we showed in the scripture that the church, as it's defined in the Bible, is a called out assembly. We showed when it began, and we showed the head of that church, and we also showed that all churches are not the same. Now, this morning, I want to invite you to listen very carefully to something that we're going to call the seed principle. This seed principle was introduced in the very beginning of time when God created the heavens and earth in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1 we can see that God created the heavens and earth in six literal days. And many times in that biblical account of creation you will see the term and each thing produced after its own kind. Now what's that mean? What does it mean that each thing produced after its own kind? Well, that means when you plant seeds of corn, and you put them in the ground, and you bury them, and you water them, and you nurture them, and you let the sunlight and the rain work on your seed, that when the crop comes up, it's going to be corn. It's not going to be anything else. It's going to be corn. If you planted seeds of corn, that's the only kind of harvest that you can have, and that is the harvest of corn, because every seed produces after its kind. It's not only true in produce, it's also true with fruit. If you look and see a fruit tree, I have a fruit tree in my front yard, and it is a peach tree, and when the fruit comes on, it is peaches. It's not apple. It's not oranges, it's not grapefruits, it's not apricots, it's apples. Why? Because it is an apple tree. So when you plant apple seed, and you plant it in the ground, and you water it, and the sunlight works on it, and the water works on it, and it grows, and when it produces fruit, it will always be an apple. Why? Because every seed produces after its own kind. Same true with acorns. You know, there's many different types of tree, elm, oak, uh, maple, cedar, uh, mahogany. There's lots of different types of trees, and there also are acorn trees. And when the acorn tree blossoms and it sprouts, what's going to be on it? It's not going to produce any other type. It's not going to produce oak leaves, or it's not going to produce elm or cedar. It's going to produce acorns. Why? Because it's an acorn tree. Every seed produces after its own kind. Now, ladies and gentlemen, every one of you listening this morning understand this principle. You understand that everything in this world produces after its own kind. Men and women produce another male or female child. They produce another human being. That's why God has forbidden in Scripture that men and men can't make together because they can't produce anything that is of its own kind. It's true with man with made with an animal, what we call bestiality in the Bible. That also is sinful because no reproduction can be done because it doesn't produce anything after its own kind. Now everything produces after its own kind in the natural, physical, and creation. God 
instituted this principle and it cannot be altered. You've never seen a tree that's growing in a yard that has ape, apples on it, oranges, lemons, limes, and apricots and grapefruits. You've never seen a tree like that. Why? Because it's impossible. Because in order to get grapefruits, you're going to have to have a grapefruit tree. In order to grow lemons, you're going to have to get a lemon tree. And to get apples, you're going to have to grow an apple tree. Why? Because each thing produces after its kind. Now, that is in the physical sense. But this morning, I want to share with you that this is also true in a spiritual sense. That each seed produces after its own kind. Now, the Mennonite faith, when I uh, lived in Las Vegas and when I did meeting work. I did a lot of meeting work in uh, Oregon, in the state of Oregon. And in Oregon, there were a lot of Mennonites that lived there. Now, they're a sect of the Amish, but they're not Amish, but they're called Mennonites. Now, Mennonites have their own creed. It's called the Mennonite Confession of Faith. Now, let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. If I read, and I study, and I put into practice the things that I read, and the things that are given to me in the Mennonite faith, confession of faith, and I obey it, what does that produce? Well, obeying the, the teachings of the Mennonite confession of faith can only make me a Mennonite. It can't make me a Baptist. It can't make me a Presbyterian. It can't make me a Mormon. And it can't make me a Christian. Why? Because the seed is the Mennonite confession of faith, and the only thing it can produce is a Mennonite. Same thing with the Book of Discipline of the Methodist Church. The United Methodist Church has the Book of Discipline. If you read it, if you study it, if you apply its teachings, and you obey its teachings, what will you get? The only thing that can be produced from reading, studying, and obeying the Book of Discipline of the, of the United Methodist Church is a Methodist. It can't get a Baptist. It can't get a Presbyterian, it can't get a Episcopalian. It can only produce a Mennonite because that's the seed that is used to produce the spiritual harvest. Same thing with the Nazarene. The Nazarene Church of the Nazarene have a manual. This is a 1972 manual. If you study that manual and you apply its teachings and you obey the things that it requires of those who seek to be a Nazarene and you obey it, what kind of spiritual crop do you get? You get a Nazarene. That's the only kind of crop you can get. It will not produce a Mennonite. It will not produce a Methodist. It can only produce the Nazarene because that's the seed. The seed was the Nazarene manual. That's what you use, and that's what you're going to reproduce. Now, in like manner, if I study the Bible, and I read it, and I understand it, and I apply its teachings, and I obey the things that it says, what will it produce? The only thing that it can produce is a Christian. In Acts 11, verse 26, they will call Christians first in Antioch. If I apply biblical teaching, if I obey the principles, if I obey the command, and I follow the instruction in it, the only thing that it can produce is a Christian. Why? Because that is the seed. The seed that I use can only produce a Christian. Bibles can only produce Christians. That is the seed after its own kind. Now, Church of the Methodists, they have different sects. They have different understandings. They don't all believe the same thing. But the Church of the Methodists can only be reproduced by applying the United Methodist Book of Discipline. The Church of the Nazarenes can only be function because when they apply the manual, of the Church of the Nazarenes. Every Nazarene church has to obey the principles and guidelines of the manual of the Nazarenes in order to produce a Nazarene. And when Christians, wherever they might live, wherever they might labor, when they study the Bible, and when they apply His teachings, and when they obey His commands, the only thing the Bible can produce are churches of Christ. It can't produce another type of church. If you read the Bible, it doesn't produce a Nazarene church. It doesn't produce a church of the Methodists or the Mennonites or any other type of church. The only church that can be reproduced by this seed is the Church of Christ. Why? Because that's the seed that's used. 
that every seed produces after its own kind. Now, the seed is the word of God. In Luke chapter 8, in verse 11, in the parable of the sower, in explaining the parable to his disciples, in Luke 8, verse 11, he said, Now, the parable of this, the seed is the word of God. Now, the seed is the word of God. And in that parable, he explained to them that the seed falls into different types of hearts. Sometimes it falls on wayside soil, sometimes on rock, sometimes on thorny, and sometimes on good ground. But whatever ground it falls upon, that's the reproduced. What's going to be reproduced is the heart, the heart of the individual. Where the Word of God falls, that's what it produces. So the seed is the Word of God. We go out there and we preach the Word. We're a bunch of spiritual farmers. And we, pre we preach the word, and we put it in the hearts of men, and however it reproduced depends upon the heart that receives the seed. But you see, the Bible alone makes Christians alone. There's no other possible way to make a Christian than obeying the teachings of the Word of God. The Word of God can only produce a Christian. If you study the Bible and the Methodist discipline, you're going to get a Methodist. You can't get a Christian, you can only get a Methodist. Why? Because that's the seed you use. When you use something more than the Bible, the only thing you're going to get is you're going to get something different because you are producing after your own kind. If you take the Baptist Manual, we talked about the Hitchcock Baptist Manual last week, and you apply his teachings and you try to say with the Bible, then you become a Baptist. You can't become a Christian. You can't become a Methodist, you can't become a Nazarene, or a Mennonite, you become a Baptist. And if you take the Bible plus the Book of Mormon, and you apply the teachings of the Book of Mormon, and you adhere to the instruction, and you obey them, then what do you get? You're going to get a Mormon. Why? Because that's the seed that you're planting. Now, many people will try to tell you, and will try to explain to us, that well, when you put the Bible and the Methodist discipline, you get a Methodist Christian. Or you get a Bible and the, and the Baptist manual, you get a Baptist Christian. And you make the Bible and the Book of Mormon, you get a Mormon Christian. Ladies and gentlemen, those are hyphenated Christians. There are no hyphenated Christians. You either you're Christian or you're not. You're either a child of God or you're not. You're either a child of the King, you're either in the Lord's Church or you're not. And when you put the Bible and you attach any other book, or creed book, and that's what we'll call them, creed books, and whenever you attach these other creed books, you're going to get something less than the Lord's Church. Why? Because you planted a different seed. The reason that there are so many churches is because men have tampered with the seed. I'll give you another illustration. If you read the Koran, and you apply the teachings of the Koran, and you obey the Koran, what will you, what will we reproduce? you're going to re reproduce a Muslim. You're going to reproduce one of the Islam faith. Why? Because that's the seed that's you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is without dispute. You, no one can deny this. That the only way that a man could become a Baptist is he's going to have to read something more than the Bible. Anyone that wants to become a Nazarene is going to have to read something more than the Bible. If he wants to become a Presbyterian, He's going to have to read something more than the Bible. If he wants to become a Mormon, he's going to have to read something more than the Bible. If he wants to become a Baptist, he's going to have to read something more than the Bible. That makes a mixed breed. There are no mixed breeds. Ladies and gentlemen, every seed produces after its own kind. The only thing that can be produced by reading, studying, believing, and applying and obeying the truth contained in the Bible is a Christian. The Bible alone makes Christians alone. Anything that's added to this book in order to achieve a religious end will make a hyphenated Christian. And there are no hyphenated Christians in the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't read about a Methodist in the Bible. You don't read about a Presbyterian or an Episcopalian or a Mormon or a Baptist or Mennonite, or an Islam. You don't read any of that. Why don't you read any of that? Because it's not contained in the Bible. Therefore, it cannot produce something that is not equipped to do. The only way 
of getting in another religion is you have to add something more to the Bible. You have to add another book. You have to add another creed. And when you do, you will get something less than a Christian. So ladies and gentlemen, I know a lot of people don't like this type of teaching. I know a lot of them just think this is my opinion. It's not my opinion. It's fact. How does a man become a Mormon? He can't become a Mormon reading the Bible. It's impossible. This book will not teach you how to become a Mormon. This book can only teach you how to become a Christian. And this book can't teach you how to become a member of a Muslim. It can't do that. Why? Because it's not that type of seed. It's not that type of book. This book, God's book, can only make you a Christian. Now, that's what we encourage you to be. We encourage you to be nothing more than a Christian, to be a child of God, to be in the body of Christ, to be part of the kingdom of God. That's what this book will give you the ability to do. And when you add something to the Bible, you get something less than a Christian. Denominationalism necessitates different seeds. You can't become a member of a denomination without applying a different set of ethics and codes. You have to go to a different book. You have to go to a creed book. You have to go to a manual because that's the only way you can reproduce that faith. And so that will produce something far less than a Christian. Now, there are also unbiblical ways to use the term church. The church building refers to as the church. Many times, maybe somebody will go by where our building is at on the top of the hill on 127 bypass, and maybe they have somebody to visit them, and they're driving by and they'll point and go, well, there's the church. No, that's not the church. That building is not the church. That is just a building. That is a place where we assemble. That's not the church. The church is its member. And so when you of referred to a building as a church, that's an unbiblical way of using the term. What church do you belong to? I am a church of Christ. What's that mean? What's that mean when somebody asks me, uh, what church are you a member? What church do you belong to? I'm a church of Christ. No, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the church of Christ. But I'm a Christian. That's my answer. The universal church is made up of local churches. That's wrong. The local church, the universal church, is made up of individual Christians. It's not made up of local churches. It's made up of every person who's put on the name of Christ and obeyed the gospel of Christ. Every one of those individuals, wherever they live, in whatever country, whatever nationality, whatever culture, they are Christians and they are part of the universal church that God son adds us to according to Acts 2 verse 47. The denominational concept is a universal church is made up of different denominations. That's a denominational concept. That's unbiblical. They would have you believe that the universal church is made up of the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Mennonites, the, the Roman Catholics, the Mormons, the Jehovah Witness, and all these different denominations make up the universal church. That's the denominational definition. You can't find that definition in the Bible because it's, it's not there. And so that's an unscriptural way of referring to the universal church as a group of differing faiths. That's not the universal church. That's denominationalism, and that's sinful, and that's contrary to God's will. The term with it, as used in the scripture when ascribed to the people of God refers to all the saved who have believed and obeyed the truth, or the saved in particular location, those who have obeyed the truth. You see, you're added to the Lord's church by the Lord. You join yourself to the disciples of the local church in order to do the work that God gave the church to do. Please read Acts 9 and verse 26. There is a big difference, a big difference, a grand difference between the biblical concept and the denominational unbiblical concept of the church. The, the denominational concept of all the churches of differing faiths, of differing practices, of differing beliefs, and all of them together because they love God and they believe in God and they believe in the Son, 
and they believe he, he lived and he died and he was resurrected. And since they believe all those facts, even though they have differing doctrines, they all belong to the universal church. That is completely false. That cannot be sustained by the Bible. And when people go to passages like John 15, it talks about the vine and the branches. It's talking about individuals. It's not talking about churches. It's not talking about denominations. That's something that's in the, the theory of human theology. Human theology is human religion. And human religion isn't the gospel. And it's not according to what God says. The church that belongs to the Lord is one that he bought with his blood, Acts 20, 28. The one that he's the head of, Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. And the one that he has all preeminence in, in Colossians 1, verse 18. And the one that he's going to give back to his father, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24 through 26. And it is the church that is his body. Is his body. And he's the savior of that body, Ephesians 5, 23 through 25. That's the biblical definition of the church. And any time you mix definitions, you're going to get something that is unbiblical. Now, before we go to that, I want to reiterate and go over some things. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody believes that they're the true church. Everybody believes that they belong to the Lord. And everybody claims to be following the Bible. Yet, they can't pass the litmus test of the truth of God's Word. If you were to ask me, if you were to ask me the question, how did you become a Christian? How did I become a Christian? I can't answer that question. Let me give you the answer to that question. I heard the Word of God. I believed what I heard. Then I repented of my sin. And then I confessed His name and my allegiance to Him. And then I submitted to baptism. Now, that's how I obeyed, and that's how I became a member of the Lord's Church. Now, did I just think those things up myself? No. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I heard this Word, I studied it, I read it, and it caused me to believe. In John 8, 24, the Bible says, Unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sin. But then, in Acts 17, verse 30, the Apostle Paul told the Athenians, At the time of ignorance, God once went down, but He commanded all men everywhere to repent. And so man must repent. It's a change of mind that starts up here in his mind and results in a change of his conduct and his action. Then he must confess Christ. In Romans chapter 10, and verse 9 and 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. For if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so I profess my allegiance. I'm going to become his servant. I'm going to be his child. I'm going to let Jesus be my master. I confess that faith. What I do is I outwardly make a confession of what I believe in my heart. And then I submit to baptism on the day of Pentecost, when the first gospel sermon was preached, and they, they were convicted of murdering the Son of God. They were pricked in their hearts, Acts 2, verse 37. And what does the Bible say? They asked the, they asked the apostles and Peter, Many brethren, what shall we do? And Peter and the rest of the apostles answered in Acts 2.38 to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, that means by his authority, in order to obtain remission of sin. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you ask me what I did to become a biblical Christian, that's what I did. I heard, I believed, I repented, I confessed, and I was baptized. And that made me a Christian. That's all it can make me. They can't make me anything else. They can only make me a Christian. Now, when you do these five things that are contained in this book, you cannot become a Baptist. You cannot become a Methodist. You cannot become a Presbyterian, nor a Mormon, or a Roman Catholic, or a Jehovah Witness, or a Muslim, or 
any amena or any other faith. It will not produce that. Only the obedience of the gospel of Jesus Christ can put a man into a spiritual relationship with God and make him a member of his church and make him one of his children. And his children's name, they are Christians. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is what the Bible teaches. That's the correct usage of the word church in Christian. Any other usage that men try to give the word church is unbiblical. And when men in denominations talk about all the denominations being part of the universal church, that is an unbiblical definition. That definition is found nowhere in the sacred text. That definition cannot be sustained by the Bible, and it is not part of the gospel of Christ. Therefore, it must be rejected. Now, we're not judging those who are in other denominations. I can't tell you why, but I can tell you that they did not obey the teachings of this book alone. Because only obeying the teachings of this book alone can you produce and become what the Bible refers to as a child of God, a Christian. Every seed produces after its own time. We have looked at the word church. We have seen that there, are, uh, there is only one, Ephesians 4, verse 4. We have seen that the Lord is ahead of it, Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23. We have seen that he purchased it with his own blood, Acts 20, verse 28. And we know that the Lord adds us to his church when we obey the gospel, according to Acts 2, 47. And we'll close this lesson this morning by asking you a very sobering question. It's very popular in our day and has been for many years to use expressions like to join the church of your choice or that one church is as good as another. What do you think about that? Are all churches equal? Is one church as good as another? Think about that. Do you want to be a member of any church? Or do you want to be a member of the one who is bought and paid for by the blood of Christ? Where he is the head. Where he has all preeminence. And the one that he's going to give his father when he returns to redeem those who have been faithful and those who are his children. Which church do you want to be a member of? What church is the one that's discussed demonstrated, talked about, and propagated in the Bible? And are you a member of the Lord's church? Or are you a member of the churches of men? The answer to that has eternal consequences. Think very soberly about your answer. Did you obey the gospel? Did you obey the Bible? Or did you obey the Bible? along with another book.